a violent husband, a hit man, or a pig farmer who kidnapped and murdered Arlene Fraser. Hi, wee ones, I'm Dawn. And I'm Cole. And this is Scottish Murders. 33 year old Arlene Fraser was living at number two Smith Street in Elgin with her two children, Jamie 10 and Natalie 5, at the time of her disappearance. Her husband, Nat, had a restraining order as he had attempted to murder Arlene previously. However, this hadn't kept him away. The 28th of April, 1998, was just like any other weekday for Arlene Fraser. She got her kids ready for school and waved them off. But that wave goodbye to her children would be the last time she was ever seen again. Elgin is a town in Murray, now with a population of over 24,000 and situated in the northeast of Scotland, lying on the south coast of the Murray Firth, approximately halfway between Inverness and Aberdeen. Elgin once had been a city in the 13th century when an imposing cathedral had been built, but the cathedral was later abandoned, making Elgin a town. The ruins of the cathedral remain to this day. For today's story, I gained most of the information from a book called Death in a Cold Town by Steve McGregor, where you can find even more in-depth information about Arlene and Nat Fraser than I've been able to include in this story. Arlene was a popular and outwardly confident person, but internally she lacked confidence and didn't believe people when they told her she was pretty. This lack of confidence could have stemmed from always being compared to her elder sister, Carol, who could apparently do no wrong. However, by 1985, Arlene's sister had married and had moved to Erskine, just outside of Glasgow, and her parents had split up, with Arlene opting to stay with her father, Hector, in Elgin, where she worked in a clothes shop. At Hogmanay in 1985, when Arlene was 21 years old, she attended a party where she and Nat Fraser, who was 26 years old, finally got together. Nat appeared to be quite the catch, as he was a friendly, confident, popular man, and he was a partner in a successful fruit and veg business in Elgin. Nat also played the guitar in a local band, as well as being a rugby player. However, there was another side to Nat. He had a habit of fighting with others, both verbally and physically, after a few drinks. But due to his friendly nature, this was shrugged off as just being Nat's way. Nat was also very popular with the females, and he would regularly have new girlfriends, sometimes even having a couple on the go at the same time. However, when Arlene and Nat finally got together at the Hogmanay party, he seemed to, at least initially, change his ways and to have really taken to her, and she him. However, not everyone was quite as taken with Nat and Arlene's relationship. Apparently, Arlene's sister Carol advised her to be careful and that Nat wasn't the best match for her. However, Arlene ignored this advice and forged ahead with her relationship with Nat, actually moving into his bungalow at number two Smith Street only four months after meeting. The couple lived together quite peacefully and happily, it would appear, both carrying on with their normal duties, Nat carrying out fruit and vegetable deliveries in the Elgin area and Arlene working in the clothes shop. It was in September 1986 that the couple announced they were engaged and had set a date for their wedding of the 9th of May 1987. However, before the big day arrived, in late 1986, Arlene found out that she was pregnant. The couple were delighted with the news and were so looking forward to their wedding and their child's arrival shortly afterwards. Arlene's wedding day finally arrived and she looked beautiful in her white wedding dress with her father Hector walking her down the aisle to the waiting Nat who wore a kilt and sported two black eyes. Apparently the stag do had turned a bit violent but well that was apparently to be expected from Nat and it was just brushed off and the couple went on to have a great evening reception. In August 1987, three months after the wedding, Arlene and Nat welcomed baby Jamie into the world. Nat and Arlene apparently were thrilled with the new arrival and they seemed to settle down into newly married, new parent bliss. Nat did want to continue to play with his band every weekend and with him working Monday to Saturday delivering his fruit and veg, Arlene was finding it difficult to bring up Jamie without Nat's support. Arlene asked Nat if he would give up playing in the band, but he refused, saying that he needed to let off steam after a full week of work, and he said that they needed the money. It also appeared that Nat had returned to his old ways from before he met Arlene. Arlene had heard that Nat had been seeing other women, but when confronted, of course he denied this vehemently. The problem was, Arlene was feeling more and more isolated. She had given up her job at the clothes shop to take care of Jamie, and she also was finding it increasingly difficult to see her friends. Nat liked this though, as he became extremely jealous if she went out without him, criticising what she was wearing for starters. He was very controlling and she was completely dependent on Nat, not only for support but financially as well, as her only source of money was her weekly allowance Nat gave to her. 
Arlene was lonely and stuck at home more and more by herself until she met 17-year-old Dougie Green, a delivery driver who worked for Nat less than a year into their marriage. Dougie ended up visiting Arlene when Nat was out at weekends and one night the pair ended up sleeping together. Nat found out about this and was furious with Arlene. As Nat's jealousy and suspicions towards Arlene escalated, he became more and more angry and eventually his anger turned physical and he started to push her around. Arlene had apparently confided in her family that she was afraid of him sometimes when he got like this. One night in 1990, when Arlene came home from a Saturday night out with her friends, she was met by an angry Nat who accused her of being with another man. He ripped at her clothes, slapped and punched her until she fell to the floor, where he then proceeded to kick her in the stomach. At this point, Arlene had had enough and she was terrified of Nat, so she took Jamie and went to stay at a women's refuge for 10 days. During this time, she also saw a solicitor in regards to divorce proceedings. However, as always, Nat was very sorry. He hadn't meant to hurt her and that he got angry because he loved her so much and the thoughts of her being with another man had just taken over. He sent her gifts while she was at the refuge until finally she agreed to move back home. Everything seemed to settle down again for a while and in 1992, Arlene and Nat welcomed baby Natalie into their family. However, Nat's jealousy festered continually in the background and every time Arlene went out with her friends, an argument between the two ensued when she returned. Apparently, from the time Natalie was born and Arlene's disappearance, she had visited her solicitor a further three times regarding a divorce. But each time, Nat would apologise and give her a lovely gift and convince her to give it another go. She actually had an appointment with her solicitor on the afternoon she went missing to discuss the divorce and finalise the paperwork an appointment that she unfortunately wouldn't be able to keep. In 1997, with Natalie now being five and Jamie being ten, Arlene decided that it was time to get some of her independence back, financially at least, and so she enrolled in a two-year business studies course at the local college to learn new skills she could use to make her own money. It appeared, though, that the allowance Nat gave Arlene was very generous as she had somehow managed to save up £3,000, or about $4,000. And in 1997, she had decided that she wanted to spend this money on a breast enhancement. She went ahead with this procedure without telling Nat, who, because he hadn't been in control of Arlene, was pretty angry about this. He took his bad temper out on her in various ways for the rest of 1997 such as hiding her glasses or contact lenses and ripping her clothes, all to try to prevent her from going out with her friends. However, in February 1998, his temper erupted again and he attacked Arlene, beating her so badly in the jaw that she was unable to eat. Following this attack, she lost weight and became depressed. She apparently told her friend Michelle Scott that she didn't love Nat anymore and was terrified of him. After this vicious attack, Nat agreed to leave the home for a month and to go and live with his friend Hector Dick, who lived on a farm just outside Elgin. However, after less than a week, Nat was seen by neighbours back at the home, and soon after, he had worn Arlene down and had moved back into the home. Only a month later, on the 22nd of March 1998, which was Mother's Day, Nat beat Arlene and strangled her to the point that she passed out. She had been on a night out with her female friends at a bar, and after closing time, the group decided to go back to Arlene's friend, Michelle's house, to continue the party. What had set Nat off this time, although it didn't take much, was that Arlene hadn't got home until 5.30am. I think maybe he could have been worried about her, but it does sound more like he was angry that he wasn't in control of her. Yeah, I agree. However, when Arlene came round, she hadn't remembered the attack. Nat had told her that she'd had some kind of fit and had collapsed. So she didn't remember being strangled? Yeah, maybe she had passed out and blocked out what had happened. Maybe she was just in shock. However, later that morning, Arlene noticed some worrying red dots on her eyelids and eyes, so she took herself to the doctor. Terrifyingly, the doctor told her that the red dots were caused by strangulation and that he had only heard of this being seen normally on the dead bodies of strangulation victims. Wow, I'm not surprised she didn't remember after that then. After some persuasion, Arlene went to the police and told them about the attack and what the doctor had said. This was confirmed by the police's own specialist. Subsequently, Nat was arrested and charged with attempted murder. Nat was bailed and had an injunction against him, not allowing him to go near the house on Smith Street or Arlene. Arlene visited her solicitor again after this and this time decided to start the ball rolling with a divorce and settlement. 
The settlement figure that her solicitor came up with was £250,000, which is about £460,000 and $577,000 in today's money. Arlene was a bit reluctant to ask for this amount of money as she knew Nat would be angry, but her solicitor reminded her that Nat had a very successful business and that this was just a starting figure and that it was best to start high and come down. So Arlene agreed and a letter was sent to Nat's solicitor. When Nat found out that Arlene was going ahead with a divorce and that the settlement figure she was asking for was in the region of £250,000, he was furious. Apparently, he had said to Arlene that if she wasn't going to be living with him, then she wouldn't be living with anyone. Nat was clearly thinking of himself as the victim in the situation he found himself in. To further anger Nat, part of the injunction was that he wasn't allowed access to his precious car, a Ford Granada, as it was parked at the house in Smith Street. Arlene had apparently started using this car, that is, until the 5th of April, two weeks after the horrific attack on Arlene, when this car that was parked on Arlene's drive went up in flames, destroying the car. This fire was apparently deliberately started. Wow, that's a coincidence, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder who could have done that? Then just over three weeks later, on Tuesday 28th of April 1998, Arlene disappeared. Arlene was seen hanging out washing at around 8.15am by a neighbour and then seen by another neighbour at around 8.50am when she was waving Jamie 10 and Natalie 5 off as they walked to their school not far away. Jamie was apparently going on a group event to Inverness with his school that day so Arlene called the school at about 9.41am to find out what time he was returning. The receptionist didn't know the time so she said she would check and call Arlene back. However, when she called Arlene back approximately 10 minutes later, there was no answer. The receptionist had been the last person to ever speak to Arlene Fraser. So what had happened to Arlene between 9.41 and 9.51 a.m.? As Arlene had Tuesdays off from college, she liked to use this day to catch up with her friends whenever possible. And on Tuesday the 28th of April, she had arranged for her friend Michelle Scott to come and have lunch with her at the bungalow. When Michelle arrived at about 11am for this lunch date, she knocked but there was no answer. The door, however, was unlocked so she went inside. She did find the fact that the door was unlocked very strange as Arlene was very security conscious. Yeah, I think that would have been a red flag for me too after what she'd been through. Yeah, me too, definitely. So Michelle called out but there was no answer. When Michelle had a quick look around, she didn't find Arlene, but she did find a vacuum cleaner standing in the middle of Natalie's room, plugged in as if ready to be used, but not switched on. She also found the washing machine on, which she also found strange, as Arlene was terrified of the washing machine going on fire, so she never put it on if she wasn't going to be in the house. She also found Arlene's contact lenses, glasses and Crohn's medication lying on her bedside cabinet. Arlene had been diagnosed with Crohn's disease a few years previous and had had bad flare-ups. She never would have left indefinitely without her glasses, contacts or Crohn medication. Michelle did notice that Arlene's favourite brown coat was missing, so she assumed that Arlene hadn't gone far and maybe she'd just got delayed. Unfortunately, Michelle had to leave as this had just been a quick lunch visit. However, she did ring Arlene a couple of more times, but each time there was no reply. This was just so unlike Arlene. She was a creature of habit and didn't just go missing for hours on end. Michelle went back to the bungalow again about 1pm, but there was still no sign of Arlene and everything was still the same way it had been when she was last there. This time, Michelle left Arlene a note asking her to call when she got back. By 3pm, Natalie had returned home from school and was spotted outside her house crying by neighbours Irene and Graham Higgins as her mum wasn't home. They knew Arlene and Natalie, so took Natalie into their home until Arlene arrived home. However, at 8pm, there was still no sign of Arlene. But Michelle had arrived back, and this time was beginning to think something was seriously wrong. Irene and Michelle went back to Arlene's home again and found everything exactly the same as before, except there was now a note from Jamie saying he had been home and had gone to a friend's house as Arlene wasn't there. Nobody has seen Jamie arrive or leave the home. When they returned to Irene's home... Following a debate with her husband, they decided to call the police. Two police officers, PC Neil Lynch and PC Julie Clark, arrived that evening and they looked around Arlene's home, spoke with Graham and Irene Higgins and Michelle Scott. However, at this point, as it was very late in the evening and there was no body or crime scene, all they could do was put out a description of Arlene to see if she was spotted around the area. 
It wasn't until the following day, the 29th of April, that detectives arrived on the scene and a detailed examination of the house was carried out and the video recordings of the whole property were taken. While it clearly didn't look like anything untoward had occurred in the property, the fact that Arlene's glasses, contact lenses, medication, passport, driving license and keys were all in the property and after taking into consideration that her husband had been charged with strangling her until she passed out just over a month ago, the police decided to treat Arlene's disappearance as something much more sinister than a missing person case. However, as there was no body or a crime scene, they knew it was going to be an uphill struggle to prove this. It wasn't until the 3rd of May, five days after Arlene was last seen, that a massive search took place of all open spaces around Elgin. This was carried out by police and volunteers, including Arlene's father and stepfather. However, Nat did not attend. Okay, so why did it take so long to arrange a search? I think it was because there was no body or crime scene and that they were just busy searching the house and doing interviews. I think they also held out a bit of hope that Arlene would probably just come back. And do we know why Nat didn't attend? No. Well, that's suspicious. Isn't it? Interviews were carried out with any potential witnesses or locals that could give a better picture of Arlene and her life. A lot of people were of the impression that Arlene had just gone on holiday without telling anyone and had just left her children to come home from school with no one to look after them. People actually thought that that's what she would have done. Yeah, I can't believe it either. She was supposed to be a caring and compassionate person and doted on her kids. There was no way she was just going to have left and gone on holiday. No, that would be classed as neglect and she doesn't sound like that type of person at all. No, I don't know what these people were thinking. There were also other rumours going around which also got into the newspapers that Arlene was into drugs, drink and sleeping around. Well, she had had that one affair and she did enjoy a night out with her female friends now and again, but did this really make her a bad person or parent or mean that she would just have left her children suddenly? Not only did her friend and sister Carol both confirm that these stories were nonsense, but the police actually carried out tests using hairs from Arlene's hairbrush post her disappearance, and this proved conclusively that she had not been taking drugs. It turned out that these rumours had actually come from Nat himself, trying to paint a bad picture of Arlene and draw attention away from himself. Nat appeared to have a lot of supporters in and around Elgin, and they were happy to repeat these untruths about Arlene. When detectives went to interview Nat, he was ready with a cast iron alibi. He stated that he started work at around 7.30am that morning and that he had also taken a van boy with him on this occasion to help him with the deliveries. This was a very unusual thing for Nat to do. He always preferred to do the deliveries alone. He stated that about 9am he had made a phone call from a phone box in Elgin, leaving the van boy in the van. He had called a Hazel Walker, who he had previously been in a relationship with but hadn't spoken to her in quite a while, and he didn't call again afterwards either. He said that the call had lasted about 40 minutes, and then he continued with his deliveries. And wait for it, it just so happened that of all the phone boxes in Elgin, this phone box was one of the few that had a CCTV camera pointing right at it, further providing and backing up Nat's alibi. Very smart if you're looking for an alibi. Yeah, that was clever. And he just so happened to have made this phone call at the approximate time that Arlene is thought to have gone missing as well. That's also suspicious. Mm -hmm. Detectives were also immediately suspicious of Nat, as this was a pretty cast-iron alibi, backed up by witnesses and a camera. Who normally has such a cast-iron alibi when carrying out their day-to-day duties? Having such a solid alibi, such as his, is almost as incriminating as not having one at all, I think, sometimes. In this case, certainly. So the police at this point have no body, no crime scene, no forensic, no witnesses, and Nat has a solid alibi. So what had happened to Arlene Fraser? Now, the police did continue to have their suspicions about Nat Fraser having something to do with Arlene's disappearance, even though he had a cast iron alibi, but all they could do was keep an eye on him. For the first few days after Arlene went missing, Nat came across as being very upset and concerned about Arlene. He checked the hospitals in the area and would constantly get in touch with the police to find out if they had any developments. However, after a couple of weeks, his attitude completely changed. He stopped contacting the police for updates. They had to contact him to tell him what was going on. He was apparently joking to his friends that the kids would get used to Arlene being away. 
So he'd gone from this really caring, worried, estranged husband who, behind closed doors, was controlling and beating Arlene, to showing his true colours and really not caring about where Arlene was or what had happened to her. Also, a few months after Arlene's disappearance, Nat started to tell anyone that would listen the story that Arlene had simply ran away and had betrayed and abandoned her family. She had left her children, Nat, her sister, her mum and dad behind to start a new life. Now it all made sense why he had been spreading untruths about Arlene's character so he could set the scene for his next plan of telling everyone that she'd just ran away, all to take the limelight off him as a suspect. He was no fool. He knew that he would be suspected by the police of being involved in Arlene's disappearance, which the police did suspect practically from the start of the investigation, but they just had no proof. Now something else strange happened. On or around the 7th of May 1998, after the police had finished with the bungalow forensically and they had taken video recordings of all the rooms, they had allowed the family back in to use it. It was a few days after that a member of the family found Arlene's engagement ring, wedding ring and eternity ring in the bathroom on a special hook. The family member was sure they had not been there before and so let the police know. The police immediately checked the video recording and discovered that these rings had indeed not been there at the time of Arlene's disappearance. So where had they come from? Nat had access to the house after the police had finished with it. So had he removed the rings from Arlene's dead body and placed them back in the house? But why? Was this perhaps to back up his story that Arlene had simply ran off and left them? But wouldn't she have taken her rings with her so she could maybe sell them for money? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense if he was trying to portray that she ran away. She would have had her rings on her. She wouldn't have stopped to take them off. And I can't imagine why putting those rings back there would work out for him. It just doesn't make any sense. Then in October 1998, six months after Arlene's disappearance, the police issued a further appeal asking for information on Arlene's disappearance, but this time stating that they believed she had been murdered. Following this appeal, a mechanic who worked in Elgin was identified who stated that he had sold a beige Ford Fiesta to a very good friend of Nat's, Hector Dick, on the day before Arlene's disappearance, that he had delivered it himself to Hector's farm and he said that Nat had also been present at the farm for the delivery of the car. What's strange about that? Well, nothing if it hadn't been a cash-in-hand job with extra cash given to the mechanic if he said nothing about the deal, and the fact that three men proceeded to take the same Ford Fiesta, having been partially crushed and burnt to a scrapyard at the beginning of May 1998, to be crushed and recycled. Although Hector Dick was questioned repeatedly about this, he denied ever having seen this car. At the beginning of 1999, with no word or sightings from Arlene, The police felt sure that she had been murdered, but without any evidence or a body, they had to set about trying to prove for sure that she was indeed dead. They needed to prove this in order to charge anyone with her murder. They did this by checking Arlene's bank accounts to see if there had been any withdrawals since her disappearance, which there hadn't been. They had to establish that she had not been in contact with any friends or family since her disappearance, which she hadn't. They checked that she had not been in contact with any GPs or opticians in the UK to get vital medication or glasses or contact lenses, but she hadn't. All the while, Nat continued his daily routine of fruit and veg deliveries and maintained that Arlene had just gone on holiday, nearly a year since her disappearance. But fewer and fewer people were buying that story anymore. Plus, Nat had the most motivation for killing Arlene. He was waiting a criminal trial for her attempted murder five weeks before her disappearance. He possibly thought he wouldn't go to prison if she wasn't around to give evidence. She was also asking for a divorce and a huge settlement, which would damage him financially. And he had an injunction against him after he had attempted to murder her, so he wasn't allowed in or near his home. If Arlene wasn't around, he would get back into his home again and see his kids. But he had a cast iron alibi, so even though the police felt he was involved somehow, obviously he couldn't have kidnapped Arlene that morning, so the case went cold. Until October 1999, a year and a half later, when Hector Dick and Nat Fraser were charged with perverting the course of justice in connection with the Ford Fiesta. However, due to the lack of evidence, the charge against Nat was dropped and Hector's trial was deferred. Then on the 1st of March 2000, nearly two years after Arlene went missing, Nat had his day in court in Inverness for the charge of attempted murder of Arlene just over a month before she went missing. This charge was reduced to assault and he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. 
Unbelievably, he was released from prison in December 2000 after serving only half of his sentence. While Nat was in prison for the assault of Arlene, the police investigation continued and they were monitoring who had visited Nat in prison. He had frequent visits from another of his good friends, a Glenn Lucas. So the police started looking at this man in connection with Arlene's disappearance too. The meetings between Glenn and Nat were recorded, but there was no audio. So the police got in touch with a deaf lip reading expert to help them determine what had been said between the two. Our findings were very damning. Basically, she said that Nat was describing to Glenn how he had cut Arlene's bones into very small pieces so that no DNA could be found. Oh, wow. He made the motion of saw in his wrist as he spoke about how he had cut her up, with Lucas supposedly agreeing that this had been a good idea and that he was sure Nat would get away with it. They also mentioned a third man involved, Hector Dick, and how he had been instrumental in Arlene's disappearance. Unfortunately, the lip-reading expert's findings were not able to be used in court, but it had given the police what they had needed. They now knew that Nat had definitely been involved with Arlene's disappearance. So why would it not be usable in court? I think it was because things of this sort were relatively new and hadn't undergone rigorous testing to ensure this was a valid practice to be used. How could he have been so stupid to say these things while he was in prison? Oh, don't worry. We'll get into that later. Oh, interesting. February 2001 was when Hector Dick's trial for perverting the course of justice in relation to his involvement with the Ford Fiesta finally went ahead, with him pleading not guilty. However, on the fourth day, Hector changed his plea to guilty. He now was stating that he had indeed purchased the beige Ford Fiesta, but that it had been to use for a drink smuggling scam he and Nat were involved in. Due to his change of plea, he was sentenced to one year in prison, and during his time in prison, he attempted to hang himself. Now, in April 2001, Nat also found himself back in prison after being found guilty for lying about his finances in order to receive £18,000, or about $25,000, of legal aid funding. This was four months after being released from prison for assaulting Arlene. He was sent back to prison this time for 12 months, although he was out again in October 2001 after serving half of his sentence. There seems to be a pattern going on here. Yes, half seems to be enough. After being released again in October 2001, Nat tried to get on with his life again, still doing his fruit and veg deliveries, but by this time there were less people who actually believed that Arlene had simply gone on holiday and left her children. People were starting to look at Nat a bit differently. It's about time. Plus, the police were constantly questioning him about Arlene's disappearance. Things were not going too well for Nat. Then on the 26th of April 2002, about six months after Nat was released from prison for fraud, Nat, Hector Dick and Glenn Lucas were indicted for the murder of Arlene Fraser, each being charged with conspiracy to murder Arlene, murdering her and attempting to defeat the ends of justice. So did they find her body or have any other evidence? Nope, nothing had changed but things were about to get interesting. The trial of the three men began on Tuesday the 1st of January 2003 at Edinburgh's High Court. The prosecution laid out their case and on the Friday the jury was shown the video recordings of the bathroom showing how there were no rings present at the time of Arlene's disappearance but that they had appeared in the bathroom on or around the 7th of May 1998. Everything seemed to be going well for the prosecution until Tuesday the 14th of January when it was announced that the charges had been dropped against Hector Dick and Glenn Lucas and they were immediately released. What? Why? Well, over the weekend, Hector Dick had decided to turn on his long-term friend, Nat, to save himself, and he had told the police an amazing story of what had happened to Arlene. He said that Nat had hired a hitman to kidnap and kill Arlene, that her body had then been burnt and dismembered in a machine on Hector's farm that was designed for cow disposal, and then her ashes were scattered. Now you might think, okay, great, now we know what happened, good for Hector. However, it just so happens that Hector had been caught by the government and had a humongous tax bill to pay due to him smuggling booze, and this bill would have ruined him. Hector didn't agree to testify against Nat until he had it in writing that the tax bill would be wiped out, which he received. Wow, you're kidding, right? (laughs) No. So now Nat would be standing alone with a new charge of arranging Arlene's abduction and murder. So the trial reconvened on Monday the 20th of January 2003 
and Hector Dick was questioned for a prolonged period of time. And of course, the question of the purchase of the beige Ford Fiesta was brought up again. Bearing in mind that at Hector's trial in 2001, he said that he had bought the car for drink smuggling that he was involved in with Nat. However, now at Nat's trial, he said under oath that he had bought the car on behalf of Nat. So Hector had lied about ever buying the beige car initially, and now he was saying under oath that he had been lying about what it was used for. What was to say that he was now telling the truth? Were the police and the prosecutors just grasping at anything they could to convict Nat as they knew they didn't have enough evidence, regardless if it was lies or not? Yeah, I'm beginning to wonder that myself. Over the course of the trial, Hector continued to say very derogatory things about Nat, blatantly pointing the finger at him for Arlene's kidnapping and arranged murder any way he could. Nat also gave evidence at this trial in his defence, where he denied vehemently murdering his wife or being involved in any way. Nobody knew what the outcome of the trial was going to be. It was very superficial and the case rested on whether the jury categorically believed that Nat had returned Arlene's rings to the house after she had been murdered. Carol, Arlene's sister, and Hector, Arlene's dad, were extremely nervous about attending for the verdict on the 29th of January 2009, almost five years since Arlene's disappearance. But they needn't have worried. Nat Fraser was found guilty with a majority verdict. He was sentenced to life imprisonment to serve a minimum of 25 years. So finally, the family had some closure and peace to grieve for Arlene. Even if they didn't have her body, they could try to go on with their lives as best they could. Right? Wrong. The story doesn't end there. Following the trial, Hector Dick appeared to have negotiated various deals with newspapers and he continued to give new statements about what had happened to Arlene, saying things like Nat had hired a hitman who had strangled Arlene at home and then Nat had gone and cleaned up, amongst other things. Bearing in mind, this man had already lied repeatedly. This was extremely difficult for their family to hear, especially when they had their suspicions that Hector was more involved in Arlene's disappearance than he had been letting on. Now, Glenn Lucas didn't just fade into the background either. He was apparently sick of having the finger pointed at him by everyone and so persuaded a newspaper to pay for him to have a lie detector test to prove once and for all that he wasn't involved. He passed. In April 2005, a book was published called Murdered or Missing, the Arlene Fraser case, which was co-written by Glenn Lucas himself. This book basically suggested that Arlene was still alive and had walked out on her children. He alleged that she had been into drinking and drugs and having affairs. The book also ridiculed Hector Dick's testimony. Glenn Lucas was still a good friend of Nat's and had stood by him protesting his innocence for years. He wasn't going to stop now. That was until he died in September 2006 from a heart attack. Now, following Nat being convicted and sent to prison, revelations about the prosecution's leading evidence for charging Nat started to come into question. There were now questions being raised about the three rings that were found in the bathroom. PC Neil Lynch and PC Julie Clark, who were first inside Arlene's home on the night her disappearance was reported, came forward to say that they had actually seen these rings in the bathroom when they had first checked Arlene's home that evening. They had apparently informed their supervisors about this, but for some reason this information never reached the relevant people, and Nat was charged, with the three ring saga being a large part of the prosecution's case. So, who removed them then? Well, it was claimed by a PC David Alexander, who had been part of the investigation, that these rings had been seen in a desk drawer of a detective sergeant. However, PC Alexander had his own problems and was in court for a breach of the peace charge in 2004 and was subsequently suspended from the police. However, he widely made it clear that he felt there was a cover-up going on in this case. He went on to give Nat's solicitors a statement where he admitted that it was a detective sergeant, David Slesser, who had told him about seeing the rings. David was also involved in Arlene's investigation. However, this fact couldn't be corroborated by Slesser, as he had apparently killed himself in July 1998. This just keeps getting more and more confusing. So, was it true that there was a cover-up going on with this case? Or was this just a scorned police officer wanting to have revenge? But why would it be a cover-up? Yeah, exactly. I don't know why. It doesn't make sense. After this came out, an announcement stated that an investigation would be carried out into what had happened in the Arlene Fraser case to see if there was any merit behind the former PC's statements. 
So obviously this was great news for Nat and so his solicitors immediately appealed against his conviction. And on the 12th of May 2006, Nat Fraser was released from prison on bail while he waited to hear about his appeal against his murder conviction. Okay, so that he's out of prison again. Yep. So is that him out of prison for good? Well, Nat might have thought so. Nat's appeal hearing started on Tuesday the 13th of November 2007 in Edinburgh. This lasted for two weeks where all the evidence was presented and gone over. It can often take months for a verdict to be decided after all the evidence is presented. So Lord Johnston, the judge overseeing the appeal, instructed that Nat go back to prison to await the result. Everyone was shocked by this. In actual fact, the verdict of the appeal wasn't announced until the 8th of May 2008. So Nat had been in prison for six months waiting for the verdict. His verdict was upheld, his appeal was refused and he was to serve the remainder of his sentence. It's like being on a roller coaster now. I can't keep up. So following this, Nat's legal team continued to ask for appeals, which were all refused. That was until May 2011 when Nat finally had an appeal granted. He won this appeal and his conviction for the murder of Arlene was quashed and he was free to live his life again. Are you kidding? What is going on here? I know. <laughs> At this point, I just feel really sorry for what Arlene's family must be going through. They just weren't allowed any peace. It's bad enough that they still didn't know what happened to Arlene or have her body. Now the only person who has the strongest motive for wanting Arlene dead and who had been making her life a living hell while she was alive was now a free man, free to carry on with his life. This verdict must have crushed them. They thought that finally at least the ordeal of going through a trial was over but it had all been for nothing and they were back where they started. No Arlene, no evidence, no witnesses and Nat free to live his life. It was, however, announced straight away that the Crown Office would be building a case in order to bring a future charge against Nat for the murder of Arlene Fraser. Upon Nat's release, the police decided that it would be a good time to release extracts of the lip-reading report, which was pretty damning for Nat. There may have been a few stragglers in Elgin who still believed that Nat was innocent, but after these extracts were released, their minds finally changed. Nat was on his own. Even his fruit and veg business partner turned against him, saying he wanted nothing further to do with him, going as far as suing him for an unpaid tax bill. So life for Nat probably wasn't as great as he would have expected back home, but at least he was still alive. However, things were about to take a positive turn for Nat. Reports had started to surface, questioning the lip reader's expertise who had been used to determine what Nat and Glenn had spoken about during the prison visits. Her credentials turned out not to be true, and when police gave the recordings and the original transcript of Nat and Glenn talking in prison to experienced forensic lip readers to see how it compared, the results were alarming. The original lip reader produced a transcript which consisted of 2,100 words, and the new experts agreed with only 234 words of this. Oh no. Not only that, but other lip-reading recordings the lip-reader had produced detailed transcripts for were reviewed and many were deemed to be such poor quality that they weren't able to confirm any words, even though the original lip-reader had produced a detailed and long transcript of what was being said. Oh my God. So not only had the Three Rings appearance in the bungalow come into question, but now also the only other evidence that the police had had now been proven unusable. How could they now possibly bring a murder case against Nat? But they did, as on the 23rd of April 2012, the second murder trial of Nat began in Edinburgh, this time with the addition of cameras being allowed to record the trial as a documentary, which was later shown on TV and called The Murder Trial. Nat's defence team started the proceedings by saying that Nat had a solid alibi and he could not possibly have kidnapped or murdered Arlene and Hector Dick was named as the actual murderer. In this trial, the questions about the ring placement validity and the lip-reading expert's report was brought up by the defence. Also, Hector Dick appeared again as a witness for the prosecution. Really? I mean, it's been proven that he lies and lies again under oath. Why bring this man to be a witness again? Plus, he was happily selling stories to any paper that would pay him. It's just annoying. 
Yeah, it annoyed others too, and the defence spent four days ripping his stories apart, basically making him out to be a liar, although he did a good job of this by himself with his ever-changing answers. Other witnesses that were called included Hector's brother, James, Nat's previous business partner, Ian Taylor, police officer Neil Lynch, who had been first on the scene, the manager and employees of the scrapyard, and a taxi driver from Elgin, amongst others. None of these witness statements were as damning as Hector's. Nat did not take the stand at this trial. Arlene's sister, Carol, and her father, Hector, went through the ordeal again of not knowing what the verdict would be and were terrified this monster would walk free again. Thankfully, they wouldn't have long to wait. The jurors took only one day to deliberate. On the 30th of May 2012, 14 years after Arlene's disappearance, the verdict by majority was guilty. Nat was sentenced to serve 17 years in prison without the possibility of parole. It was finally over for the family. They again had the verdict they deserved. They must have been overwhelmed with emotion this time, that finally they could concentrate on their grief of losing Arlene and not have the continual threat of her killer, her husband, being a free man. And that was the case until September 2013. Oh no, not again. When Nat tried to appeal the verdict of the second trial. However, this appeal was refused. Thank God. (laughs) To this day, Nat continues to plead his innocence and has tried to appeal the verdict on numerous occasions. He will be 69 when he is eligible for parole. After the second trial, Hector continued to give exclusive interviews for money, obviously. Even as recently as the 28th of April 2018, he's been making statements to the newspapers. This time he was urging Nat to finally reveal where he had buried Arlene's body. Arlene's family continued to believe that Nat arranged for Arlene to be killed, but many of them believe they know who the actual murderer is and that he should be behind bars too. Now Nat's daughter Natalie, who in 2020 was 27 years old, went on to have her own children. She has always maintained that her father is innocent of killing or being involved in her mother's murder. She insists that the actual killer was her dad's then friend, Hector Dick. Jamie apparently lived in the bungalow in Smith Street for many years, with Natalie living there when she briefly split up with her partner. Arlene's dad, Hector, who at the time of recording was 79, has only one wish for Nat Fraser to finally reveal what he has done with Arlene's remains. And finally, Hector Dick. He is still living in Elgin. Is it fair that this man told so many lies that he didn't know himself what was true anymore and that he had his tax bill written off? This man turned on his friend, told more and more outrageous lies and yet he has lived a long and free life. Has there been justice for Arlene Fraser? Now obviously there is a lot of information about this case and there's only so much I can say in this episode but like I said, I did get a lot of information for this episode from a book called Death in a Cold Town. The Arlene Fraser Case by Steve McGregor. I really enjoyed reading this book. As strange as that sounds, there was so much information there that I just couldn't find anywhere else. If you have time and want to know even more about this case, have a read. I'd highly recommend it. And that's the end. If you've enjoyed this episode and know just the person who'd also like it, please share it with them. Don't keep it to yourself. Please also get in touch on social media if you have any questions, comments or suggestions and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All social media and contact details are on our website, scottishmurders.com, as well as all the source material and photos related to this episode. So that's it for this week. Come back next time for another episode of Scottish Murders. Join Join us there. there. Bye! Scottish Murders is a production of Clurinton.